So hello and welcome to everyone who has joined us. Um, tonight's parent workshop is on building resilience. Um, my name is Dr. Tamar Scully. I'm a clinical psychologist and I'm joined tonight by Dr. Beth Mosley, consultant clinical psychologist. Um, and we're both from the psychology in schools team in Suffolk. Um, so what we're hoping to cover tonight is essentially giving you uh, an understanding of what resilience is and why it matters and why it's so fundamental to the well-being of our young people. Um, we're going to talk about resilience in the context of the five pillars to well-being. So we're going to think about each of these pillars on an individual basis. And importantly, we are going to think quite a lot about how we can practically support our young people to develop more resilience through the use of these five pillars. Um, if you can go to the next slide, Beth. Thank you. So just before we get started, um, we thought it might be really helpful just to ask you, what are the main things that you're kind of worried about for the summer holidays? I guess, given the context of the year that we've all had with the pandemic and the school closures and all of the uncertainty and disruption we've had in our lives, um, so, so lack of activities over the summer holidays, lack of routine, yeah, and it, it, the cost, yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, our, it feels like our children have been back in school for such a short time that it kind of tolerating another break with everyone being at home um, after the last year is really tricky. So someone's really identifying that, staying home too much after the last year. And it's really hard. It can feel very claustrophobic um, to kind of be stuck at home for long periods of time. Screen time, yeah, absolutely. And somebody has said that they're kind of worried that friends have kind of stopped exploring. Um, somebody has said lack of support. Yeah, because, you know, I think that the structure and routine of the school year actually give us a lot of support. And yeah, for sure, like not being able to go on a proper holiday to kind of break up the summer. And I know I got really anxious, actually, about the summer not having any structure. So I, I ended up booking quite a few camping holidays so I'm hoping that that might help with that a little bit because it is hard if you don't have anything planned. Working from home and your kids just looking after themselves yeah and we you know you know we've already done so much of this and we know how difficult it is to work at home um, and have our children at home as well and I think this is going to be a challenge this summer like lots of people are still working predominantly from home so they're not having that kind of break from the house and going into work. And someone is saying that they're unsure that professionals are still going to be able to support. Um, yeah, for sure, that's a worry because those services aren't quite back to normal yet either, are they? Oh, that's really helpful. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, I guess what we want to start with is, you know, what is resilience and why does it matter? And I guess the overarching theme is that for our young people to kind of have well-being, they must have resilience. And, you know, what we know is that all of our young people, regardless of their circumstances, are going to face challenges. Some of these challenges are going to be small and surmountable, and some of them are going to be much bigger and perhaps not so surmountable or so easy to manage. And I guess resilience is about experiencing these challenges and kind of being able to remain upright and continue moving forward. I think what's really important to recognize about resilience is that it is not about never feeling frightened or sad or scared. And it's definitely not about kind of clearing all the adversity away for our young people, even if that was something that was possible. It's actually about encountering challenges 
feeling those really healthy, normal emotions like anxiety or worry, but learning to kind of keep going anyway. Um, and I think, you know, often we hear young people being described as, oh, he's just a very resilient child he, or she'll be OK. She's very resilient. And, you know, while we recognize that some people, some children do find it much easier to bounce back than other children, resilience is not something that we're born with. You know, it is something that our young people and ourselves can kind of cultivate through our lives. And, you know, I think one of the most exciting things that we know now about our brains is that they change through the experiences that we expose it to. And, you know, what this essentially means is that with the right experiences, we can support our young people to build more resilience. And I guess today, what we want to think about is what are some of those experiences and how can we as parents or carers kind of facilitate and create opportunities for our young people to experience them? Uh, next slide, please, Beth. Um, and I guess just before we kind of move on to the, the five pillars that we're going to talk about, I just wanted to mention temperament. So, you know, while resilience is not something we're born with, I think it is really important that as parents or carers, we kind of take into consideration the individual temperaments of our children. You know, I'm sure most of you on this call can resonate with the phrase, oh, you know, my children are just so different. And I know that this is definitely something I can resonate with. You know, one of my children can go through something fairly tricky and kind of bounce back fairly quickly, whereas my other child would find that much more difficult. And I think that is just reflective of how it is. I think some children will experience a significant challenge. So if you take even a simple idea, you have a child who practices and practices and practices and then has a trial to get into a football team and they really want to get into that football team and they don't get in they you know they'll be sad they might feel angry for a little while but you know after maybe not a very long time they're able to kind of move on and they're able to kind of get involved in other things but you might have another child who goes through the same experience so they've also practiced a lot and they haven't got into the football team but actually for this child, it might be a really significant challenge and it just might take them longer to be able to engage and to be able to continue moving forward. And I think as parents, we just need to be led to a certain extent by our young people. You know, we are the people at the end of the day that kind of know them the best. And I guess it's important to just recognize when, the, when you need to kind of push them to kind of take those risks and take those chances and when they need to be a little bit more cushioned. Um, okay, so Beth, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so for the next part, we are going to talk through these five pillars. So I, I guess what we know from the research is that each of these five pillars play a really important role in our well-being and resilience. And essentially, these are the things that kind of support us and our young people to kind of move from a, pos a position of surviving into more of a position of thriving. Um, and I think it's important just to say that Beth and I are going to cover quite a lot of information in this workshop tonight, but obviously we are a little bit constrained by time. So what we're hoping to do kind of over the next couple of months is to record a podcast where we can talk about some of these ideas in a little bit more detail. Um, so just so you can kind of hold that in mind uh, that there will be kind of a follow-up just in a slightly different guise. Um, lovely, Beth, if you can go to the next slide. Thank you. Okay, so the first one of these pillars is relationships and connection and kind of why, why this matters. And it really isn't an overstatement to say that relationships are the cornerstone of resilience. You know, sometimes I think when we think about resilience, we can often think about children being very independent. But actually, resilience is very difficult, if not impossible, to develop um, 
without relationships with the people around you. So I guess these relationships will be the relationship that they have with you as their parent or carer, but these relationships can be anyone in the life of the young person. So it can be teachers or coaches or aunties or uncles. And I guess in terms of relationships, there's one thing that the research is really clear about. So if our young people have at least one consistent supportive relationship, then their ability to kind of manage those ups and downs, those curveballs that life throws at all of us, um, it'll be so much better. And, you know, I guess the reason for this is because it's within relationships that we kind of develop our core strength. And it's within relationships that we develop that capacity to be flexible and to kind and, and it's also in these relationships that this is where we kind of learn how to understand and how to respond to kind of the world around us. So the relationships we have with those people we're close to are incredibly important. Um, and I, you know, I think the other thing that's just worth mentioning here is that, you know, what we know about positive, strong relationships is that they're actually more predictive of long-term outcomes than adverse childhood experiences like trauma. So, Essentially, what this means that, you know, if your child or young person has kind of experienced some kind of significant challenge um, or trauma, the ongoing presence of having kind of that responsive, supportive relationship, that's the thing that will influence their trajectory more than the trauma. So that's how powerful relationships can be in terms of um, in terms of our resilience and our well-being. Um, and I think, you know, one of the reasons why positive relationships are so powerful is because they actually have the ability to switch our stress response off or to put the brakes on our stress response. And, you know, this makes lots of sense when we are kind of in the company of people who care about us. What this does is it sends this really clear signal to kind of our brain and our body that we're safe. And, and once that signal has been sent, it's then much easier for our body to kind of reduce all of that adrenaline and cortisol that is kind of coursing around our bodies. Um, and, and if you've been at our previous workshops, then you know that, you know, it's really clear that relationships are the biggest predictor of health and happiness across the lifespan. So there's just loads of reasons why this is so important. Um, if you could go to the next slide, Beth, thank you. Um, so I guess kind of what we want to think about is, you know, how do we support our young people to to um, develop their relationships and to connect more with people? And I think, you know, one of the things that I, I didn't put on this slide, but I think it's really important to mention is that, you know, if we can increase our child or young person's exposure to the people who care the most about them, this is massively beneficial. So, you know, we all live in systems with wider extended family. And actually the more time that our young people can kind of spend in the company of grandparents and aunts and uncles and, um, and aunts and uncles, or even people kind of in clubs or schools, this is linked into so many good things. So from the research, we know that this leads to higher levels of positive emotion, more self-esteem, motivation, um, you know, optimism and, and definitely resilience. So that's just a really helpful thing to kind of hold on to. What psychologists call this often is something called relational wealth. Um, the other thing I think is that's important to, to think about in the context of how we support them is this idea of opportunities to connect. So particularly for children or young people who might find the school environment difficult in terms of their relationships, what will be really important is that we are creating opportunities for them to develop peer relationships in other areas. So, you know, maybe if they join a club that they're kind of passionate about, um, sometimes this can kind of ease this process because when you join something that you're really interested in, the likelihood is, is that there's other people in that club who are also really interested in the same thing. And actually having a shared interest 
makes it so much easier to kind of form those new relationships. So that's just something to kind of hold on to over, over the summer months if you are concerned about kind of their, their connection or friendships with their peer group. Um, I guess the other thing is, you know, just recognizing that we as parents or carers, we cannot be everything to our children. You know, sometimes the support or advice, they might, it might come from somewhere else in the system. You know, it might come from a family friend or even a member of staff at school that they've kind of clicked with. And, you know, I think as, as a parent, this can sometimes feel a bit tricky because, you know, we want to be the person that, that they confide in. We want to be the person that they really want to spend time with. But I think if we're able to kind of take a step back and kind of give them some permission to develop this relationship, this can actually be really beneficial in terms of building up their connection with more people outside of the family. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was uh, this idea of rupture and repair. So in our clinics, we often see young people who are struggling with like ruptures in their peer relationships. And I'm sure you've had multiple times um, at home when your young person has kind of come home from school and they've been really upset because of a fallout in their relationship. I know it's certainly happened in, in my family a lot. And, you know, for teenagers in particular, this is incredibly tricky because because of their developmental stage, they place a great deal of privilege on their peer relationships. So ruptures in those relationships can be really difficult to manage. And I guess where young people often struggle is repairing that rupture. And I think this is where we can really help them by modeling the process. Um, and I guess this, this happens when we respond to situations in kind of a helpful way that results this. So when, so for example, if we have a situation with our child where we've responded in a way that we didn't want to because we've, we, we're just juggling so many plates that we have kind of shouted at them for something that maybe wasn't their fault. And as a result of that, there's kind of been a rupture in the relationship. But the most important thing that we can do in that moment, if it's possible, or later on is also okay, is we can repair that rupture. And we do this by apologizing to our child for getting our response wrong and trying just to create a space to kind of think together about how to make it right. So it might look something a bit like, you know, I'm really sorry for the way I handled that. You know, my voice was too loud. I did, really didn't mean what I said. I am sorry. You know, and, and then you might follow that up with, you know, do you have any ideas about how we might have been able to manage this better? And I guess this does a couple of really important things. So it shows our children that kind of hard, messy things can happen in relationships, but the relationship can actually be OK. And it also models for them how to apologize and put things right, because regardless of who our children are or what experiences they are going to have in their lives, they are going to have ruptures in relationships. So, so being able to show them these two things in your relationship with them is really important. Now, I know that for many of us, this can feel a bit daunting, it can feel a bit unfamiliar. And, you know, I think this is understandable. I think apologizing to anyone kind of makes us feel vulnerable. And you know, this will always be slightly elevated when it involves people who are important to us. But I guess what we know is that rupture followed by repair will deepen the connection and trust between you and your child. And what this will do is it will go a really long way to, to developing and deepening their resilience. And um, so if you can go uh, Beth, to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so the next thing that we're going to talk about is pillar number two, and it's why is it important to be, at, be active and how does this kind of help build resilience? Um, 
So some of these ideas are taken from a really wonderful book called Burnout, which was written by Emily and Amelia Nagotsky, who are twin sisters. Um, and I guess, you know, what we know now about stress is that it has a beginning, a middle and an end. So, you know, sometimes or maybe all the time we have parts of our lives that are kind of naturally stressful. So, you know, a new job, a redundancy, a poorly parent, surviving a pandemic. You know, and I this is also the case for our young people. So, you know, on a daily basis, they're managing lots of big and small stressors. So, you know, the, the academic pressure at school, ruptures in their relationships with their friends, worries about the future, maybe difficulties in relationships at home. You know, even for primary school children, I think when when children, when there are ruptures in their peer relationships at primary school, this can feel really tricky to manage. So what we call these things is stressors. So these are the things that activate the stress response in our bodies. The stress response, on the other hand, is that physiological process that happens in our bodies. It's kind of like, you know, when the fight, flight, freeze response is activated. And, you know, this is really important and a very natural process. And it's super helpful if you're being chased by a really big dog and you need to be able to fight or you need to be able to run away. But not so helpful when it's been activated by kind of everyday things that we all experience, like, you know, giving a presentation or walking into a party on our own or sitting an exam or any of that kind of normal stuff. Now, for this workshop, the part that we are interested in is what happens to the stress in our body when the stressor is something that is we can't easily deal with. So, you know, like academic pressure in school that goes on for a really long time for our young people or you know, friendship issues that don't seem to resolve. Like I will often see young people in my clinic and they, they just have ongoing friendship issues um, that they're feeling very stressed about. Or, you know, for other young people, it might be like continual self-criticism about not being good enough. So that inner critic just constantly talking in their heads, telling them they're not good enough and activating that threat response. And in these situations, our young people can get stuck in the stress cycle, meaning that their bodies can be just continually flooded with these stress hormones like adrenaline and cortisol. And there is just masses of, of research now that tells us that this is not good for their physical or their mental health. And actually what it does over time is it really diminishes their capacity to be resilient. So in these situations, it is, absolutely essential that they give their bodies the resource it needs to complete the stress cycle because by completing the stress cycle you reduce the hyperarousal in their bodies so so i guess when we don't complete the stress cycle on a daily basis what happens is those all of that stress from the day just accumulates in their bodies and then their ability to be resilient and manage the stressors just gradually over time reduces and reduces. And I suppose where this brings us to is, is why being active is so important. So the single most effective way to complete the stress cycle is to literally do anything that moves our bodies enough to get us breathing deeply. So you know, if your young person is able to do it for 20 minutes, that's brilliant. But if not, any amount of time moving our body is helpful. So the way Emily and Amelia kind of describe this is they say physical activity is what tells your brain you've successfully survived the threat and now your body is kind of a safe place to live. And essentially what that means is that you are just signaling to your body that you are safe. And when you do that, your body is able to naturally reduce that hyperarousal. So what we're gonna have a think about now is how we support our young people to be active. And 
you know, when I was writing these slides, I was kind of smiling to myself when I was thinking about, you know, all the hundreds of penguin bars and promises of ice cream that I kind of use to bribe my own children who are seven and nine to go for a walk. And, you know, it's really hard. And I know that this battle can take on a whole new level of significance when it's teenagers that we're trying to get to be active. So one of the things that I think is really helpful for us to understand is why it's so hard to get our kids or ourselves to exercise. So there's a psychologist in the States called Stephen Allardy, and he has just been really helpful in, in kind of explaining this in a very accessible way. So, you know, he talks about exercise being completely unnatural, like not, not so much because like our bodies aren't designed to move, but because our ancestors, I guess, had to be incredibly active every day, providing shelter and food. So they never, ever, ever would have exercised for exercise sake, because it would have been just such a massive waste of energy. And what this has done is that it has given our brain this kind of default programming about exercise. And and our brains are kind of programmed to only spend energy doing kind of meaningful goals or meaningful activities. And otherwise, basically our brain tells us be as lazy as possible. And, and you know, this is why when we think about going out for a run, like this definitely happens to me, I think about going out for a run and I kind of get this feeling of dread in the pit of my tummy, like I really don't want to go sometimes. But essentially, one of the reasons this is happening is because my brain is kind of saying, don't do it. You're kind of you're wasting energy. Um, so so it's 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 kind of normal, I guess, for us not to want to exercise. And one of the ways to work around this for our young people is to make our exercise feel like a meaningful activity. So if you take my kids, for example, they definitely complain slightly less about walking when they understand how important the walk is for kind of the happiness and the health of their one-year-old puppy. And I think the reason why they, they'll walk much easier is because then the walk suddenly has a little bit more meaning. And, you know, similarly, I think for young people, sports like football or hockey, I think they provide our young people with kind of opportunities to be act active in kind of a, a very meaningful way. So I think it's just a concept that's very useful to hold on to over the summer when you're trying to kind of increase the activity levels for, for young people of any age, really. Um, the other very helpful idea is, is this idea of temptation bundling. And this is an idea that comes from Catherine Milkman. And essentially, it's the idea of combining something that you want to do with something that you really need to do. Um, and I heard this really quite cool example of this. Um, there was a, um, a guy in Dublin who was an electrical engineer and he loved Netflix. It's all he wants to do. And I'm sure loads of you can resonate with this if you have teenagers in particular. Um, but he also knew that he kind of, he needed to exercise more often than he did. So what he did was he kind of put his engineering skills to use and he kind of hacked his stationary bike and hacked into his laptop and he set it up so that Netflix would only play on his laptop when he was cycling on his stationary bike. So essentially what he did was he bundled watching Netflix, which was the thing he really wanted to do, with riding his stationary bike, which was the thing that he really needed to do. Because I guess ultimately you're more likely to to find something attractive, like a behavior attractive, if you are able to do one of your favorite things at the same time. So I guess it's just, it's something again, to just hold in mind with our, with our young people when they're really struggling to do something. Um, so just before I hand over to Beth, I'd just like you just to take a minute on Slido. So this summer, what activity could you support your young person to do more of? So any kind of activity that jumps into your head and you think, OK, that might be a possibility. I might be able to support them to do that a little bit more. Riding bikes in the forest. Awesome. 
And actually, you know, when you're riding bikes in the forest, it's also a really nice way to kind of strengthen that connection with your young person. So you can kind of temptation bundle being with your young person and riding in the forest and also kind of having conversations with them about what's going on in their life. Shopping, skateboarding, awesome. Dancing and walking. And I think, you know, for younger children, actually, um, you know, some of this is a little bit easier because they often, they're more up for it. So, you know, one of the things that really helps with my kids is kind of kitchen discos where you put the music really loud and you just kind of dance um, dance away some of the difficulties they're experiencing. Photography, roller skating, long walks and swimming and karate. Great. Gardening. Yeah. And, and you know, all of, you know, you're, lots of the examples that you're putting up here are very easy to do alongside your child or young person. So it's it, all of these really lend themselves to, to really nice uh, possibilities for connection. Lovely. Okay, I'm going to hand over to Beth now. Sorry, I didn't mean to so abruptly change the, the screen. But no, no, that see, is absolutely. Can you see fine. the video of me out of interest? I can. Yeah, I can see you. Okay, I just can't see it. So, thank you, Tamara. That's really great. Um, and actually, just thinking about some of those uh, things that you mentioned, um, watching sunset and sunrise. Wow, stunning, really, and very much brings us to our next point here, really, one of the pillars about being in the present moment um, and kind of understanding today why this matters. Dr. Christine Carter's made a really good observation. She said that, you know, in this day and age, our young people are facing some significant challenges, challenges that we didn't face when we were growing up. And in order to kind of meet those challenges, one of the things that we need to encourage them develop is focus. Um, and if you think about the amount of stimulation and the amount of information that your young person processes on a daily basis, coming a lot of it, not just from what they're doing at school and getting to school and what they do when they get home, but we know the pressures of the virtual world um, and screens can really have a huge impact. I have a 12 year old daughter and she can't really be away from her phone for, for a longer period time because she comes back and all of her friends have been on a group chat and there's about 500 messages within five minutes. So our young people are having to negotiate a lot of distractions, a lot of stimulation. Um, and we know really that multitasking, although it's a helpful skill to have, it also creates problems. When we do lots of things at the same time, we can't really apply ourselves in the best way. So we tend to not do the tasks as well as we could do. We also know there's only so much information that we can take in, especially when we're um, in a learning environment or even when we're maybe watching something on a screen. So obviously you're paying great attention to Tamara and I, but if you have something going on in the background or you have the radio on, you would very much struggle to properly listen to and think about the information that we're sharing with you here today. So how do we help our children with this, develop this really important skill and it feel like a positive thing? Well, this is where we introduce the concept of flow. Mihaly, I think that's how you say it, is a Hungarian psychologist who has researched the key to happiness, which he claims is an internal state of being. It's not necessarily driven by external events, what you do have and what you don't have. Instead, he has noticed within, within his research that people who have the experience of flow, which essentially is being involved in an activity that nothing else seems to matter. So you're doing something you love, you're completely absorbed, and the rest of the world time fades into the background. I'm sure you can think examples of that for yourself. It could be reading a really good book. It could be if you're a writer, writing. It could be if you're a painter or you're into artist, artist work, when you're in that moment of creating that creation, producing music, playing an instrument, when you might be engaging in some kind of athletic activity, if you're into dancing, those types of things 
we know that people, when they manage to get that wonderful balance of just having the right amount of arousal and enjoyment, so they're, they're not bored, they're really actively engaged, but they've also got a sense of achievement and control because they can do the thing that they're doing quite seamlessly without having to think too hard about it. We know that that, that flow is incredibly good for our, for our brains. It helps downregulate that part of your brain, which does all of that self-criticism, the kind of internal dialogue that many of us get stuck with, the kind of noticing the things that we're worried about. All of those things fade away and we're very much caught in the moment and it tends to be that we're using another part of our body whilst we're doing that. This is also really helpful, not just for our frontal cortex, which is that part of our brain that does a lot of thinking, but it's also really helpful for our dopamine system. So we know that we produce a lot of dopamine, which is our kind of reward um, hormone, whilst we're in this state of flow. So we're getting pleasure out of it. And so I guess it's thinking about how do we encourage these opportunities in our young people, where we get that opportunity, where your skill level and your challenge that you've got at hand are equal. So it's a, cha a, a challenging task that feels doable. It has a sense of effortlessness. And you know, if you're really trying to learn some chords on the guitar, I've tried to teach myself guitar, that doesn't feel effortless. That takes a lot of concentration and effort. So this is kind of the next stage up where you might be able to play that piece of music. And I have like an image in my mind of my eight-year-old son in the garden one day with a big long stick, he's watching a lot of ninja films and he was just transfixed for about 20 minutes, practicing, just caught in his own world, practicing these ninja moves that he, he, kind of, he could just see the pleasure and the moment and the enjoyment of what he was doing and how he was completely and utterly absorbed. And it just looked so healthy and rewarding. So, one of the things that you might think about, well, a lot of the time my kids seem to be in flow is when they're on their screens. That's when they, because um, one of the things we know is when you're in flow, it, it's really difficult. Distractions disrupt the flow. So when you, you distract your child from watching something that they're really immersed in or playing on a game of Fortnite, we often have that question in our minds, you know, what's going on here because our children do not like being stopped doing what they're doing. And I, I think one of the things that we were thinking about, how does flow link to screen time? Because we're all probably quite anxious about just the level of screen time our children have. And Mahali Met talks about this a little, and he says that actually, if you're very passive and you're not actually doing something active, you're not actively engaged within that screen time, then it's probably not going to be flow. So I can think about my son who often plays Minecraft and gets into that zone of building a, a really amazing kind of castle or world. And you can kind of see he is in that flow. He's in creative zone. He's kind of totally immersed. He's using his keyboard as if it's part of his brain. And he's really getting so much pleasure from, from that. I think when you watch your children play Fortnite, you see something else, you see hyper arousal, the arousal is much higher. And you often see your young person's stress system is being triggered. Even if they're enjoying it, there's a quite a lot of getting worked up, banging keypads, shouting, come on, come on. So I think what we know is, is that certain screen time activities could support flow positively, but other ones will actually be quite negative for that young person. We're gonna do a podcast on this because there's some new research coming out. We've already done a podcast on screen time, but we're gonna do an updated podcast. And again, as Tamara said, if you're ever interested in taking part in a podcast, please email us on our admin address because we really encourage parents to join us so we can discuss those things with you in that kind of conversational style. And it's really helpful for other parents. So how can we practically support our young people with having opportunities for this flow? And you know, we're thinking about our young people here, but hold in mind yourself as well. What are the things that you do which give you that sense of satisfaction, that opportunity for flow? And, and actually mirroring, modeling us doing that as parents can often be quite helpful for our young people because they can see how we are prioritizing 
uh, and enabling ourselves to do that. One of the things that we can have a think about here now is focusing on strengths. Leah Waters does an amazing amount of work on this, thinking about moving towards an approach to parenting where we help our children maximize the skills and talents they already have rather than compensating for what they lack. So the idea is that we're switching the focus. It's really difficult, isn't it, as a parent? It's really hard. We all have a negativity bias. It's built into us as human beings to kind of essentially keep us safe. So it's really hard to not focus on what our children are getting wrong or what they're not getting right. And what Leah Waters really is proposing is if we start off in a position of focusing on getting to understand our child, our children's strengths, and we build up their strengths first, then we can move on to supporting them around their weaknesses rather than the other way around. Um, and the beauty of this is we can really think about our young people in terms of what they bring to our family rather than kind of focusing on um, the challenges that we they, they sometimes pose to our family. And sometimes our children can overplay to their strengths. So for example, for my daughter who's 12, she's got an amazing sense of humor. She probably is gonna do some stand-up comedy at some point in her life. She, she makes people laugh and she loves making people laugh. So this is where we think about how do we spot our young people's strengths? So something they're good at, your young person probably needs to be good at that thing, have a kind of natural aptitude for that thing. They need to have, you need to notice them having the energy that they feel good doing it. So yet my daughter, she's very, she's got a great wit about her. She's very witty. She's very satirical. Um, she's just got that view, it comes naturally to her. And she feels good when she's got, she ma makes these comments and she, she enjoys kind of making people laugh. Um, and she chooses to do it. She, she uses it a lot in, in life and, and it kind of adds something to the dynamic in, in our family, positive, sometimes not so positive. So sometimes we can identify strengths in our young people and we can notice that they might be overplaying to them. So for example, my daughter's humor can often end up in some, with some difficulties because she's overplaying to that strength. She's actually going into school and she's using this humor to make her classmates laugh. And to her teachers, this manner, this approach actually seems quite rude and disrespectful. And so actually we can have a conversation with her and her teachers about this being one of her attributes, but actually she's overplaying to it. And how can we kind of get her back online so that that attribute isn't becoming a problem for her? So it just kind of helps you shift away and helps you build your young people up, build what they're good, up, good at up. And so when you think about flow activities, I think it's important to think about strengths as well. Um, for example, my youngest son absolutely loves football. For him, practicing outside, you can see him just on his own practicing, great. He's in that flow space, he'll just run outside and do it. He loves being on a team, he plays on a Saturday, he'll get up every Saturday morning, he'll get his sports clothes on, he can't wait to get out the door. My 16 year old son at the same age, hated football. I tried to encourage him to do it. I'd drag him out of that bed on a Saturday and he would basically <laughs> protest and he would enjoy it. He would be on the pitch. It wasn't one of his strengths. My elder son's not massively athletic. My younger son is. And I've kind of worked out three children on to actually focus on supporting my children's strengths rather than making them sometimes do the things that um, they really have no interest in and aren't naturally able to able to do. Um, so and this opportunity for flow time can be really helpful in building up your, the kind of bank of feel good, building up a sense of mastery, self-esteem. And that's really helpful when we think about times when your child might have to engage in di difficult activities because they will, they will not be able to avoid um, engaging in difficult activities. And so that flow time helps counterbalance that. So have a think now, think about a strength your child brings. That, and one of the ways to think about this is, if you notice a good behavior in your child, when you see something good, think about what the strength that sits underneath that behavior. 
So for example, my daughter is very good at organizing her younger brother, sometimes to the point at which he becomes overwhelmed, but I can really see her strength, her skills of independence, thinking about other people's needs, wanting to be organized. Um, so and yes, my eldest child, he's not remotely athletic, but he absolutely loves cooking. And he has his flow moments when he's in the kitchen and he's preparing a meal. And one of the important things to hold in mind about flow is that distraction is really challenges flow. So you might find if your young person is in a flow activity, so for example, when my eldest child is cooking in the kitchen and his younger sister comes in and disrupts that, he gets really annoyed, like overly annoyed. I always think, why? And, and it's very much about him being in that place of flow and finding those distractions coming in. When we play board games now as a family, it's like the phones have to go away in order for us to all properly engage in that game and none of us be distracted by our phones. So we've got some examples here. So um, hula hoop hooping, and we saw the hula hoops on the other side, the trampoline drawing, reading. Um, so absolutely, you see a young person on a trampoline totally immersed in that sensation of jumping up and down. What about you? What might be some of your flow activities? So my son is great at baking, not great cleaning up after, but the food is delicious. The daughter's amazing at drawing, and this is how she expresses her emotions. And this is where I think we have this great opportunity. Young people, everybody, loves having a sense of belonging. So your son and your daughter, their contribution, the strengths they bring to your family are really wonderful because they, they kind of give that sense of connection, that sense of what brings you together as a family. You know, it's wonderful to think in the summer holidays, your son can be baking some amazing things and your daughter can actually maybe help design some, some mural in her bedroom. These are all great things we can rely on. And as we move, our, as our young people move into adolescence, quite often these strengths can support us with ideas, working out what we might be doing with a new scheme for this, that, or the other, thinking about what we're gonna do in the holiday. Um, yeah, a good book and some time by the sea, absolutely. Swimming for me is definitely a type where I can go into that flow state. Although getting to the pool and getting into the cold water often is exactly how Tamara described early, early on. Um, so let me move on to the next thing before we I go on any longer because I do keep talking sometimes. OK, so we're going to move on to the next pillar now, learning and why this is so important to resilience and well-being. We know that a sense of achievement, a sense of success, is really, really important for, for, for building resilience um, and essentially for, for that kind of well-being going, in, going into adulthood. One of the things that we know about the brain is this um, incredible neuroplasticity that we carry throughout our lives, but it's definitely stronger in those younger years. So our children developing that flexibility and that adaptability and opportunities to learn new things and develop new skills enables their brains to fire in ways that grow new neurons and new pathways so that young people can grow and develop their skills. Um, so, and that has all really good stuff for the brain. It kind of feeds the brain. It feeds the sense of um, having more opportunities for success. And sometimes within that, we are often trying to protect our children from getting it wrong, protect our children from failing. And that's where adolescence can be so tricky because we kind of want to say to our kids, you know what, don't do that. That's a disaster. I know I was there when I was your age. Listen to me, you need to do this. But we often know that for our young people, they have to learn through experience. They have to have those moments and work it out for themselves, being told, is not enough. So we often have to stand back and, and kind of act as coaches to our children, just be available when things don't go so right. But through that, our children get the opportunity to learn about how it can go, how, how to basically avoid that failure potentially in the future, how that actually, even when things do go wrong, it doesn't have to be catastrophic. It doesn't have to be the end of the world. There are some ways out of this. So they're learning lots of skills on how they approach tasks, 
how they respond when things don't go to plan. And we all know life doesn't go to plan. It brings along so many unexpected hurdles. And if our young people have experienced failure with support from those around them, have managed to kind of think that through, talk that through, and then experience success, then those young people will be developing those skills for life. And when they hit a, when they hit a hurdle or they hit a hiccup, they're not going to completely feel like all is lost. They're going to have that sense of there is a way around this. Um, we know that repeated failure, not having opportunities for success is negative. And for many of our young people, we need to think about how do we set our, their, their environment up so they're more likely to succeed, particularly for some of those things that they find challenging. My youngest child is incredibly organized. He likes to get all of his clothes out the night before and if he can't find a school uniform and this place he expects it, he'll, he'll go and look for it and find it somewhere else. My eldest two have always been atrocious at that. And so when they were younger to make the mornings easier, I would end up putting their clothes out the night before. I don't need to do that for my youngest child. So our adaptability and flexibility and our kind of ability to kind of, we call it the zone of proximal development. So encouraging our children to just learn something that's just within their reach and having that positive experience builds up self-esteem, builds up skills and learning. So how do we support that? Well, what we know is if young people know that they can actually help their brains grow, that their attainment isn't set in stone, that actually with effort and work um, and opportunities, their brains can grow and develop and the sky's the limit. We know that young people, the research is that young people just knowing that enables them to have this growth mindset um, versus a fixed mindset which then encourages them to put in more effort, to feel more motivated. It's self-referred, it's a fulfilling kind of cycle because then that young person has with a higher motivation and more effort is more likely to, to successfully uh, attain what they're working towards. Um, and what we really focus on how we do that is the way the language we use with our young people. We can fall into habits of saying, oh, you're so clever. You did so well on that assignment wow, aren't you a brain box or haven't you done well? You know, aren't you lucky you got your dad's memory or whatever it might be. Um, what we know is really helpful for us as parents and the adults in young people's lives is to actually praise the effort that they might have put in. So it's praising the process. You were really organized with that assignment and you planned it out over three nights. And I, I'm really proud of you for that. I noticed how much effort you put into that. Now, it might not be the best paper mache model in your whole year group, but actually it you put so much work into that and you persevered and you stuck with it and, and you were able to hand that in and that makes me feel really proud. So we're really focusing on young people, what they're doing, the skills, the attitude, the strengths they bring with that. My daughter's incredibly stubborn and that's a massive, it can cause problems, but it's also a massive stress. So I often say to her, remind her, you know, you don't give up on things and that's brilliant. That's amazing. And, and I think that noticing those strengths, noticing how we can provide our children with more opportunities to develop this growth mindset can be incredibly helpful and reminding our kids of the power of yet. So I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it yet. And nothing in life comes easily. You know, I, if I was gonna run a marathon, I couldn't just stand up and run that marathon today. I would absolutely have to train for it. I'd have to build in months of training, but I could probably do it if I had the motivation. Um, so we, we often get stuck and our children get stuck in this expectation that things happen instantly. They should happen now. We should be able to do things straight away. If I'm no good at it, I, sh I, I should be able to do it straight away. And it's reminding young people that most things in life, even if it's something you're talented and great at, still requires practice um, and still requires effort. Um, so the power of yet is a useful tool, not just for your young people, but for you as well, especially when you might feel stuck with something. And I've got three minutes left. I'm doing better than at the lunchtime. I think I had 30 seconds left. 
So the final pillar is the benefit of kindness. And if your household is anything like mine, it's not necessarily a kind place. I often think my household is the worst place to be if you actually feel like you want somebody to be kind and gracious to you. It's the reality check of life. It's where you hear about all the things that you crap at and how you're annoying somebody. And dinner times can just be explosive events where people are just, just kind of tearing each other down. And we know that this feels absolutely horrendous when we're parents. It can feel really demoralizing. Sometimes you think, I don't want to be in this family. Um, but we know that the power of kindness is incredibly important, not just for the person who's demonstrating the kind act and the receiver, but also the research shows us that if you just observe somebody else doing a kind act, it actually produces lots of positive neurochemicals and makes you feel better. So building kindness into our relationships, um, it, it, it's a really helpful thing, but it's really hard. I think in some respects, it's harder to do it in your own family where people tend to see the worst of you. I think, what was it the, the other day? My, my children were just so ratty and moody and so rude. And I just felt like no one else in my entire life <laughs> talks to me like this but it's kind of the you know we 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 I think in our families we feel safe enough to show show off our grumpiest self I, I've always put my best self, self on these parent workshops and I get grumpy too um, so it's a really tough thing to do but I guess when we think about our young people we think about our families we can support our young people a by modeling it um, because they are going to notice what we do rather than um, what we say. Um, we can be kind to ourselves. Self-compassion is such an important thing and often um, we get stuck with that internal critic and we can actually be quite hard on ourselves and so I think quite often doing that talking aloud, that self-compassion out loud, we can often be quite hard on our young people too. We can notice we get stuck into that zone and nagging, you haven't done this, you haven't done that, you haven't done this again and I'd really recommend going back to um, the, uh, the strength-based parenting, we've got the resources at the end. But there's lots of free resources. And I think that approach helps you move away from noticing all the deficits and using your young person's strengths to kind of help remind them of how they can be more organized, how they can not dump their bike in front of the, the back door and, and, and how they can do things in the ways that we know are important life skills for them to develop. Um, and I guess when our young people feel like they're doing something that's helpful to us, they're making a contribution. My eldest son has just finished his year 11s and I'm asking him to make dinner in the evenings and for him to get his brother off the bus. And I really let him know, you know, this really helps me. Mowing the lawn really makes a difference to my life. So feeding back to our children, that their kindness and their acts of kindness don't go unnoticed and they make a difference to us as parents it can be really important and help them build a sense of mastery, um, responsibility, even more important as our young people go into adolescence that we give them more opportunities to do things independently that can be supportive within the family unit playing to their strengths. So my son loves cooking. So him cooking dinner every night is not something that I'm going to have to have a battle with him over. Um, so it's trying to think about what our young people are more likely to be able to do and encouraging them to support and add to the family with those things. So I think we've just gone one minute over. There's a couple of lovely resources here. The New Adolescent written by Christine Carter. The Strength Switch by Leah Waters. And if you go and Google all of these people that we've mentioned in the presentation today, there's lots of podcasts. So if any of this has kind of whet your appetite because each one of these things we could talk about for days probably. Um, but hopefully some of those things have maybe helped you think about, well, I'm gonna go and follow that up. And again, we'll send these resources around. So just two last slides for those of you who are on Slido. And if you're not on Slido, please pop it in the chat so we get this information. Could you just let us know how helpful you found this session? Um, it's really important for us to know that we are, we are responding and meeting the needs of the parents and we can't sit with you in a room. So it's really difficult, isn't it? To kind of know how, if we're hitting the mark or not. Um, and if we're not hitting the mark, we want to think about how we can do it better. 
So really helpful to have your Slido feedback there. That's, that's beautiful. And the last question for you before you go, it'd be really helpful if you can just answer this. What two things will you take away from this workshop? This is really important for us. It tells us uh, what stands out for you. And if we ever repeat the workshop or sometimes we get asked to deliver 45 minute equivalents of these workshops, um, we know we won't take those two things out if we get general consensus. It's also important for you. We know it's human behavior. If you uh, learn something new, if you put down, if you choose one or two specific things that you want to do differently and take away, then you're much more likely to do them. So um, great, we're seeing a lot of emphasis on flow here. And you know, I was one of the other things I was thinking about with the strength-based um, parenting, it's also thinking about you playing to your strengths as a parent, um, and then you'll bring more energy into what you do. And I think that's really been helpful for me because there's some things I am useless at as a parent, and there are other things I'm much more interested in. And actually what I've realized that rather than trying to get better and kill myself doing the things I'm not so great at, if I can focus on kind of using my natural strengths as a parent, it just seems to, I bring a lot more energy to the job of, of being a parent and it's a blink and difficult job. So wonderful. Thank you so much for contributing tonight, for taking part in the workshop, for sparing your hour this evening. Uh, at probably a busy time in your household. So thank you again. Uh, and we look forward to hopefully seeing you in some of our future workshops. Again, remember that you can come back to this in the recording. We appreciate there's a lot of information. Um, it's on YouTube, so you can also just play it as, a, as an audio. Um, you don't have to watch us and see the slides again. Um, and we will be recording a podcast. So for any of you who are interested in participating, then please email us on our admin.pst at nsft.nhs.uk um, and we will make contact with you and put you on our podcast list. We're actually recording one to tomorrow, aren't we, tomorrow on adolescence. Some of the things we've touched on today are covered in more detail in our other workshops. Actually, I was thinking about this earlier. Some of the anxieties we've got about the summer holidays are some of the anxieties we had about surviving lockdown. And we've got an hour workshop on surviving lockdown, Mark three, I think it was. Um, and that might be quite a helpful workshop to visit for those of you who are thinking about what to do over the summer period. So, so thank you so much for joining us and, and have a lovely evening. Lovely, thank you so much. Good night.